Welcome to Outrage Overload, a science podcast about outrage and lowering the temperature. This is a special remix of episodes 8 and 9. In my research, I've found that uh, what I've called morbid curiosity uh, is a really normal uh, human behavior, and it's you know pretty distributed across the population. Some people have a lot of it, some people have a little bit of it, but most people have some of it, right? Uh, and so, you know, feeling the urge to sort of slow down and look, or feeling the urge to click the link to see the photo, uh, it doesn't indicate any kind of psychopathology or any kind of, uh, there's nothing wrong with someone for doing that. It's, it's human nature, I think. That's behavioral scientist Colton Scrivener. We've introduced quite a bit of research so far with this podcast. It makes sense to recap some of that research briefly to put the research we will present in this episode into context. We introduced the podcast with a two-part series with Peter Ditto, professor of psychology and social behavior, telling us about the political sectarianism paper published in Science Magazine, that was a result of an effort by many world-class scientists. Here's Eli Finkel, another one of those researchers, talking about that paper. If you think about the range of moral variation that can agree on these issues, that, that there's reasonable overlap between Democrats and Republicans in their actual beliefs. This is at least consistent with the idea that, that a lot of our fighting might not be so much about the ideas themselves. Well, what might they be about? Look, we obviously do have some fights about ideas, but there might be something else going on. And, and I would argue that this other thing that's going on is a much bigger source of our divergence, of our hatred, um, than uh, differences over ideas and policies. So, so the second one we've called political sectarianism. This was our first paper. This is like an all-star team of people that got together to say, well, what is it that we think we know across six disciplines about the nature of this other type of polarization, like polarization, other than disagreeing about ideas, you could call it social, you could call it affective. Um, we called it sectarianism. We argue that political sectarianism has three core components, othering, that is a very strong us versus them mentality, aversion, it's not just that it's us, us and them, like I'm pretty different from the Inuits, I'd say that's strong, I'd be high on othering, but like, do I dislike them? No, I don't dislike the Inuits, so it's also this part, but it's not just that they're different and you dislike them, you think they're bad in a moral sense, right? And it's the three of those things that in, in combination that we've argued is especially dangerous. As noted, the political sectarianism research examined a vast array of related research, some of which we've also cited in prior episodes. We talked to Kurt Gray, professor of psychology and neuroscience, about research showing how virality metrics, that is simply showing how popular messages, can cause moral panics that in turn result in expressions of outrage. We, we've long known that outrage is linked to this idea of punishment, but I think the, the novel take of the paper, uh, especially when it concerns social media, is that this outrage is done to kind of manage these authentic feelings of threat or danger, and not just because people are trying to look better in the eyes of other people. These discussions have often cited other science in the related fields. The research we discuss in this episode is no exception. Specifically, we will cite the political sectarianism research, among others. One of these bits of related science I want to talk about a little bit is negativity bias. The research we've seen has found that negative language spreads on social media and elicits expressions of negative emotions, creating a repeating cycle, essentially a feedback loop of negativity. Subsequent research has confirmed and expanded on this finding again that negativity produced more engagement than positivity in political discourses on social media. Here's psychologist Rick Hansen. Well, we all kind of know what it's like from the inside out. Say you have a job review, a performance review, and your boss gives you 10 kinds of feedback and nine of them are positive and one of them is room for improvement. Well, what's the one you think about for the rest of the day or, right? or, or my boss doesn't understand me. Dude. Or you have interactions, let's say, with uh, your partner or a friend and nine of them are positive and one is kind of irritating. Well, what's the one you review as you fall asleep and are still thinking about when you wake up the next morning. Uh, so that's 
our nature. We're like that. Why are we like that? Uh, the key idea here is that our ancestors over 600 million years during the evolution of the nervous system needed both to get carrots and avoid sticks. Carrots like food, sticks like predators. All right. The negativity bias is really useful if you're trying to work in a war zone or you grow up in what feels like a war zone. But for most of us, it's like a it's like a feature that's now a bug. Part of this is our reward system. This is particularly the case with social media in terms of things like likes and shares. Psychiatrist Sarah Johansson explains. So we're rewarded for our engagement on social media with likes, hearts, comments, and reactions. And when posting a photo on Instagram, every like functions as a positive social reward, and we're motivated to continue seeking this positive stimuli. So when we post a photo on Instagram and someone likes it, we get a release of dopamine and it motivates us to post again. And it's not just the pleasure rush of the like, it's the intermittent absence of the like that keeps us engaged. A common analogy is a slot machine in a casino. We wouldn't play if we were rewarded every time. Intermittent variable rewards are more addictive than predictable rewards. The research we're going to talk about today builds on all this. I'm your host, David Beckmeyer, and on this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast, we're going to meet a researcher who set out to determine what goes viral on social media when it comes to political discourse. My name is Steve Rathchey. I am a postdoctoral researcher in psychology at New York University, and I just finished my PhD at the University of Cambridge in psychology. Just officially passed my PhD about a week ago, so I'm freshly a doctor now. The paper is titled, Outgroup Animosity Drives Engagement on Social Media. You really want to listen to this conversation, but I'm going to give you now a few answers to the test, if you will, a few of the key takeaways you should know about. Exactly as the title says, this research finds that referring to the outgroup, or in other words, the other side, gets more retweets and shares. Further, referring to them negatively boosts the effect even more. It found that liberals and conservatives got about the same benefits. In other words, this boosting effect applies roughly equally to both red and blue. This research is somewhat unique in that it also looked at Facebook data. Many studies have focused on Twitter data because historically it has been easier to access for researchers. Parenthetically, that may be changing. More on that in a moment. But anyway, this research looked at Facebook and Twitter data and found similar effects on both platforms. Something a bit surprising. So now, please enjoy my conversation with Dr. Stephen Rathjay. Other studies have sort of found that that this negative affect type language mm -hmm. and this moral outrage type language have been predictors for, for social media engagement. And then in this mm -hmm. study, you sort of take that to another level where this out group language is an even stronger uh, predictor. Right. And so in that, there's a whole bunch of jargon there that it might be nice to kind of at least give a quick overview for. So, so starting off with kind of what's this in group out group language and what does that sort of mean in practice? And then, um, you know, a little bit about what does negative affect language mean? What does moral outrage language mean? And then, and I actually do want to dive a little deeper into this outgroup language and, and do don't talk about that, but we can do that in subsequent questions as well. Yeah. So um, when I started this paper, my main question of interest is what goes viral on social media? So I looked at a lot of prior research on what goes viral, and I found a number of studies suggesting that either, as you mentioned, negative affect language tends to be associated with increased virality on social media. So these negative affect language is usually measured through various dictionaries of words. So um, people will collect words like bad or sad or unhappy, just any word that could be labeled as depicting negative emotion. And the presence of one of these negative emotion words in a tweet or a Facebook post will usually predict increased virality or engagement of that post. People will be more likely to share negative posts. My 
friend and collaborator Claire Robertson in my lab has also recently found that people are more likely to click on news headlines if they have a negative word in the post. So this seems to be an example of what psychologists have called for the past few decades the negativity bias. We sort of selectively attend to negative information. And there's this is a very well replicated finding. We seem to be biased toward the negative. There even tend to be more negative words in the dictionary than positive words. There are more negative adjectives than positive adjectives. So it seems to be sort of um, human nature almost to attend more to the negative. So this seems to be an example of that on social media. And then uh, you also asked about moral language or moral emotional language. There was a paper, I think in 2017 in PNAS that talked about moral contagion on social media. And this was done by um, William Brady and um, my current postdoctoral advisor, Javon Bavel, where they found essentially that the presence of a word that was both moral and emotional so basically, they created a dictionary of words that uh, evoked sort of moral content and emotional content. And these would be words like hate or evil or blame. The presence of these words in tweets led to an, uh, an increased engagement on Twitter. And they looked specifically at political conversations. So if people were having political conversations online, if they said something like hate or blame, this led to increased popularity. So a lot of this prior work on virality focused on emotion, either negative emotion or moral emotion. And I was interested in extending that to look at how sort of uh, social identity, intergroup conflict, and some of these like us versus them motives might promote engagement on social media. So I looked at the presence of words referring to an in-group or an out-group member on social media. And I specifically looked at political posts on social media. So I looked at uh, news media tweets and Facebook posts. So these could be tweets and Facebook posts coming from Fox News or the New York Times. I only looked at news media that had partisan leanings. So that were classified by something by a media bias chart that was developed by all sides as either being left leaning or right leaning. Or I looked at left leaning or right leaning politicians. And I looked at whether a politician or a news media source would refer to an outgroup. So an example of that is if Breitbart News, which is a Republican-leaning news outlet, mentioned the word Biden, or if uh, the New York Times, which is a left-leaning news outlet, mentioned the word Trump. I found that if a politician or news media source referred to the outgroup, they were much more likely to get retweets or shares. And this effect was much bigger than the effects found previously of moral emotional language and negative emotional language. And interestingly, I found that most people were referring to the outgroup in a very negative context. And we saw this when we looked at Facebook reaction data. We saw that when people were referring to the outgroup, it got a lot of angry reactions and a lot of haha -ha reactions, which sort of indicated that you know people were reacting to these posts negatively. They were perhaps with outrage or mockery. And if you looked at ex example posts referring to the outgroup, so one example is uh, Breitbart. When referring to Joe Biden, they said, check out Joe Biden's latest brain freeze. And they sort of took a video out of context of Joe Biden sort of struggling to say something. So these were references to the outgroup that were very negative. And I think overall, the main conclusion of this paper is that social media might be creating perverse incentives for outgroup animosity, for us to express outrage at the other side and show selective instances of saying like, hey, my enemy is terrible and here's an example of my enemy being terrible, which seems like it could have adverse consequences for society and polarization. Yeah, and we should probably clarify that a little bit. I mean, this in-group, out-group language is pretty common in, in psychology mm -hmm. and in and, and, and related kind of subjects, social science and so on. And we should probably make that clear. And in this case, in-group and out-group is primarily kind of liberal conservative is right. pretty much what you looked at. Yeah, and going back on this language, yeah, I, I often assume like everyone knows this language, but I am in my social psychology bubble and not everyone necessarily does. This language is based on... Um, classic experiments in something called social identity theory, which was developed by um, 
Henry Tajfeld, I believe, sort of in the 1970s. And Tajfeld did a number of experiments where he would basically like randomly assign people to two different teams using a flip of a coin. Like you are part of the red team and you are part of the blue team. There'd be no reason for this team assignment. It would be completely arbitrary. And he found, and he was also surprised by this, he found that people would start automatically discriminating against the other team. They would want to allocate more money to their team and not give money to the other team. They would sort of automatically just feel a sense of group membership, even if the group membership was arbitrary. So this research really established that we tend to just automatically identify with groups that we are a part of, which we call the in-group, and we automatically tend to discriminate against groups that we are not a part of called the outgroup. This seems to be sort of just part of our human psychology. It might be part of our evolved psychology since we evolved within sort of these small groups of people. And uh, yeah, and a lot of people use this in-group and out-group language to describe a lot of um, political phenomena nowadays because um, a lot of people's engagement with politics doesn't seem necessarily to be rational or based on policy preferences. Instead, a lot of it seems to be based on identity and team membership. We treat it almost like uh, a sports game nowadays. Right. It. it uh, thank. Thank you. Thank you. That was. That was. That was very helpful. Right. I mean, I think it was John. Ro- John Rose says something like, you know, there's something wrong going on in our hearts, you know, that's causing us to do this. But, um, mm-hmm. you know, and then it kind of has that reinforcement thing. Right. I, I kind of already mm-hmm. think they're bad. Now I think they're more bad. And it just kind of and then I'm going to say totally. something bad and then somebody else thinks they're bad. Yeah. And it, and it kind of just you keep getting a much more um, keeps increasing or amplifying the amount of your negative impression of, of, of your adversary. So it sounds like in that, I, I kind of want to clarify a little bit that, so the, the negative affect language dictionary is sort of the same, regardless of the source, it's sort of sad or, or bad or things like that. You didn't use like a different dictionary for one side and the other. No, it's just basically a list of like 500 negative words. And the same with the moral words, right? Yeah. But then the, the, but then the out group words are sort of unique to each side, right? It sounded like that those were different words. So like Trump, would that only appear? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So how we collected these out group and in group words is we, uh, so we took a list of all the Republican and Democratic Congress members. We also used a few Democrat and Republican identity terms. So if a Democrat said Republican, or if a Republican said Democrat, so just words referring more generally to the other side, And then we also took a list from YouGov of the 100 most popular politicians of each side. And we combined these three separate dictionaries into one dictionary that would refer to the outgroup. And we also did a number of robustness checks to make sure that like it wasn't just a byproduct of our specific dictionary that was driving the effect. And we found that like whatever dictionary you used. So if you just used a dictionary of the identity terms for the other side, so calling the other side Republicans or conservatives, It would have about the same effect as if you were referring to specific politicians or specific Congress members. Um, So this effect seemed to be robust to whichever dictionary you chose, suggesting that it's the more general effect. Yeah, I mean, yeah, right. Yeah, that's 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 important to know. Mm -hmm. You know, I think you also found that I guess you, you already kind of mentioned this, but that this angry reaction was kind of the most popular, which, you know, seems to be. What some other research has found, you know, related to that, but not sort of the angry reaction, but sort of similar kind of uh, seems like that mm. this outrage kind of response. And I think in the in the um, paper, you say, I think I'm going to quote for one second. Uh, uh, Posts about the outgroup may generate engagement by inspiring negative emotions such as anger, outrage, or mockery. I think you actually said that earlier. Right. Yeah. So. You know, I think it was some other research. I think you even cited this research that I saw not too fairly recently that there was sort of this crossover that outgroup hate has kind of become a larger factor in sort of political mm-hmm. partisan identity mm-hmm. than in-group love. And yeah. this isn't saying quite the same thing, but it seems kind of related or in alignment with that, right? Yeah, it's basically building off of this. There was a big paper on political sectarianism in America, and the researchers defined political sectarianism as 
othering, aversion, and moralization of the other side. It's basically like another word for partisan animosity. It's just a bit more specific. Right. Um, and in the paper they found, so as a lot of us know, affective polarization or hatred toward the other side has been increasing over the years. But they looked at how, like, they looked at these effects separately by in-group love and out-group hate. And it seems like out-group hate is in decreasing much more steadily than in-group love is rising. And they also found in this paper that out-group hate is a bigger predictor of someone's voting behavior than in-group love. And a lot of other people have referred to this um, phenomenon as negative partisanship, suggesting that we're increasingly defining our political identities, at least in the United States, based on who we hate rather than who we love. So it's not like we're a big fan of our own party. We just hate the other side so much. And that's what motivates us to vote. And it seems like that's also what motivates us to share at least political content on social media. Well, and some of that maybe kind of this idea of the virtue signaling kind of thing. I sort of get credit mm -hmm. as a good in-group member if I um, if, if I share something negative to, to the out-group. Totally. Yeah. And I think virtue signaling is a really interesting concept because a lot of people have talked about how social media is performative and we might not necessarily feel the same emotions as we are expressing on social media because obviously social media rewards you if you express outrage and you express a lot of emotion you'll get more likes and shares and you might not necessarily feel those emotions there was a great paper by one of my collaborators william brady um he's now a professor at northwestern it was about over perception of outrage on social media and they had this really cool setup where they would um as researchers they would see if someone was expressing outrage in a tweet they developed something like a machine learning classifier to detect outrage in a tweet it was very cool and then they would dm the author of that tweet and they would ask how much outrage they felt while tweeting out that tweet and then they would show that tweet to, you know, another participant in an experiment, and they would ask, how much outrage do you think the person who created this tweet was feeling? And they found that audiences viewing the tweet thought the person was feeling a lot more outrage than the person who created the tweet actually did, which sort of gives some evidence for this virtue signaling thing we're talking about. People might not necessarily feel the emotions that they seem like they are expressing. Hmm, interesting. Well, and I think it's also important to note that like a lot of these studies, um, I, I, and I think you can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but it pretty much finds that these results kind of apply roughly similarly to across liberals and conservative. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I, I was also important about this study that a lot of these studies rely on Twitter data because it's so kind of readily available. Right. And I, I, it's cool that this study also looked at Facebook data, which is a little bit more rare and kind of found that it also applies across those social media platforms platforms, which tend to give you this idea that this may be a more kind of universal or, or fundamental sort of thing. That, that, it, I, I get questioned all the time. I, you know, on this podcast, I try to be the observer and just talk about these mm -hmm. things, not take positions on issues or say mm -hmm. which side is better. But the follow-up question I always get is, but the other side's worse, right? <laughs> whatever, whatever your yeah. definition of the other side is. Yeah, I mean, I think the study was really interesting in that we didn't find any differences by political party. We found that basically conservatives and liberals expressing animosity toward the other side got about the same benefit in the number of retweets and shares. And I also thought it was really interesting that we found very similar effects on both Twitter and Facebook, suggesting that um, at least in political context, some of these patterns are universal. and. It is interesting because in a lot of my other research, especially a lot of my other research on fake news, I do find large, we call them like ideological asymmetries, which is basically what we call differences between Republicans and Democrats or liberals and conservatives. Generally, I do find a lot of large ideological asymmetries between liberals and conservatives, such as conservatives sharing or believing more fake news. But it was interesting that this effect was relatively even for both parties. Right. Well, you know, I, that does raise a question that probably isn't something you look at, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on it. You know, we talked earlier about kind of those dictionaries about mm -hmm. what the outgroup, how outgroup messaging was, was flagged. Is there a, 
quantitative difference or a magnitude difference? Like were the words on one side sort of more egregious or <laughs> abhorrent or, you know, these were just sort of words that were fairly neutral? I mean, the dictionaries of outgroup words were pretty neutral because like you would find the effect if you just use lists of the names of Congress members from the other party. You would find the effect. And that was relatively even for both sides. And again, you would find the effect no matter which dictionary you use. We tested out three different dictionaries for robustness checks. So again, just from those checks, I don't think it is a dictionary specific phenomenon. And and you didn't notice any sort of like this outgroup animosity coming from one side seemed to be larger in some way, not not numerically, but sort of in sort of some qualitative way than the other side? No, not in this particular data, we didn't notice. I mean, I know other researchers have had, have found ideological differences for similar phenomenon. For instance, again, this is another study by William Brady, who I previously mentioned, When he was looking at moral outrage on Twitter, he found that he was looking at differences between Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And he found that Donald Trump uh, found more of a experience, more of a benefit for expressing moral outrage on Twitter than did Hillary Clinton, suggesting that he maybe uh, was using this phenomenon a bit better. But when we were just looking overall at Congress members and news media sources, we didn't find any differences. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it, we, we often, again, talk, go to these social media sources because they're good mm-hmm. uh, sources of, of, of data. You can kind of get large quantities right. of data. It's much harder to kind of go get, you know, a real, real life survey of, of 10,000 people or something. Mm-hmm. But it, and, it, and sometimes you, in, in some of the literature, you, you sort of see these conversations like, well, mm-hmm. social media, and, and we even talked about it a little bit today, but social media is like a different place. So you're going to be a little bit more hostile or more uncivil because it's the animosity and things like that. And I'm kind of questioning that. It seems like some of this is starting to carry over into real life, or maybe the the social media behavior is kind of foreshadowing what we can expect to see in real life. And and again, I want to be careful there because some of that might simply be influenced by kind of the kind of outrage porn out there that people always show us these people being uncivil and it may not be that common. Yeah, I mean, I think it's certainly starting to bleed into real life. I think like, especially during COVID, we started spending more and more time online. And I think that we're sort of learning norms online and norms online might be very different. And then we might like sort of infer things about other people or the world based on our online experiences and carry those into offline environments. But yeah, I mean, I think social media might be a distinct place from the real world for a few reasons. First of all, I think that, uh, I I mean, the sample I was analyzing in the study was political tweets and political Facebook posts. And the people engaging with these tweets and Facebook posts were probably much more politically engaged, much more politically polarized, and not necessarily representative of the entire world. Second of all, I think part of the reason we experience a lot of trolling online is because a few trolls can be really loud and not experience uh, sort of filters. There was a recent study I found that suggested that like 0.1% of um, people are responsible for like 30% of hostile behavior online or something like that. I probably don't have the exact statistic right, but it's a very small number of people who can be very loud and very vocal. And I think because of the incentive structure of online platforms, again, you get engagement if you are toxic or emotional or dunk on the outgroup online those like very small number of trolls can be amplified. And then we can look online and we assume that this is how the world is, even when it's just like a small number of people being very vocal. Right. And that social sort of penalty for not doing it sort of causes some of these moderate voices. In other words, sort of not being harsh, harsh enough that some of these more moderate voices, I think kind of self silence to a degree as well, because they get kind of squeezed out by those extreme, extreme voices. Right. Totally. So, you know, we, we find here that the outgroup animosity produces engagement, you know, when you're targeting this outgroup, you know, that the targeting the outgroup amplifies sort of our status as a good member of our in-group. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that the in-group love did, did not have that same effect. And, you know, I, I, I'm trying to 
what see, figure out kind of what that means and and I, it wasn't clear of did that did that imply that in group love actually sort of made you a lesser member of your own in group or just that it didn't have the same amplification of making you a better member I think I mean I would be really curious to maybe run a follow up study to see like what um what like an in group thinks if an in group politician expresses in group love versus out group hate because I'm not necessarily sure if like out group hate goes viral because we like it more. I think it goes viral probably because it captures our attention and because it's it's maybe different from what we usually experience. There was a follow-up study to this particular study that I did um, that basically replicated my findings using machine learning methods. It was very cool. And they found, and I, we also found this in the supplement of our paper, that politicians actually express out-group hate less often than they did in-group love, but they got more of a social, uh, of a viral benefit from out-group hate. So it's interesting that politicians still aren't expressing out-group hate very often, and I think that suggests that it might come with a penalty. If you're always expressing hate, you might be perceived as antisocial, and I mean, I think you can see this with some politicians like uh, Biden. Biden seems to be taking maybe the more like civil approach. He seems to be a unifying leader. But in uh, the few instances where he is a bit more unfiltered or says something a bit sassy about the other side, I think that gets attention. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily a good strategy to express outgroup animosity all the time. Um, I guess you see some politicians, like I think Trump took advantage of this. I think he was often expressing outgroup animosity. I'm not sure if it makes people like you more. I think it just gets more online attention. Hmm. Okay. So I know misinformation wasn't really a main focus of this paper, but mm -hmm. you have a few comments about it. It comes up a little bit in the paper. And uh, for instance, you found that false rumors spread farther and faster than true ones. And that, that kind of seems like something as old as time, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> from grade school. But um, and it, it seems like it might be something to do with it sort of more sensational, more titillating. Right. Is there, there anything else you can say um, that you took away from this regarding misinformation or that we should take away from it? Yeah, I think, uh, and that's a very popular study from like 2018, I believe, that found that fact-checked false rumors spread further than fact-checked true rumors. And these were rumors as defined by Snopes, the fact-checking service. And I think they did some follow-up research suggesting that the false rumors tend to evoke more disgust and surprise when they looked at sort of the emotions that they evoked. And I think that overlaps a little bit with the outgroup animosity phenomenon when you're like, uh, I think, disgust outrage, outgroup animosity. I think these are all very overlapping emotions. And um, Michael Bing Peterson also has a great paper where he finds that people, the people who share fake news most on Twitter tend to be the most politically polarized and dislike the outgroup most. And he also did like sort of a content analysis of like what uh, fake news stories were um, including in their headlines. And he found that like a lot of conservative fake news stories included words about the outgroup or words referring to liberal. So I think those findings suggest that part of why fake news might be popular on social media is because it is uh, constructing this malevolent idea of the outgroup. It's playing into this outgroup uh, animosity phenomenon. It's playing into moral outrage. So um, as you say, I think uh, fake news can often be more titillating and more interesting and fulfill a number of psychological needs better than the truth. And that kind of gets to that kind of motivated, I think you call it motivated tweeting or something like that. <laughs> I did bit. refer to that. Yeah, <laughs> that was like the initial title. Um, yeah, because I was drawing on classic research on motivated reasoning. We, we tend to believe what we want to believe. And uh, I think that outgroup animosity, whether it is true or false, can fulfill a number of psychological motives, can be what we want to believe. I think believing, uh, being a part of an in-group makes you feel good about yourself. It makes you feel a sense of self-esteem and feeling better than an out-group can also boost your self-esteem. People report that they don't want this kind of partisan animus, but uh, 
at the same time, this is the content people engage with. So we kind of get what we deserve, I guess. Right. <laughs> and I don't wonder the political leaders yeah. do it. Right. Yeah. And uh, to expand on that, we actually, we just conducted a study and I just, um, I published the preprint. So it's on my Twitter. It's not yet peer reviewed, but we have a preprint out where we got a nationally representative sample of Americans. And we first asked them what kind of content they think goes viral on social media. And people answered that they thought the moral outrage goes viral, that negative content goes viral, that content that's negative about outgroups goes viral, and that misinformation goes viral. So people sort of correctly had this intuition that all this kind of stuff that past research has said goes viral does go viral on social media. And then we asked this group of participants what they want to go viral on social media, what they think should go viral. And people overwhelmingly thought, and this was a consensus both among liberals and conservatives, that misinformation should not go viral, that moral outrage should not go viral, that outgroup animosity should not go viral. Instead, people said that they thought that positive content, nuanced content, educational content should all go viral. So when you actually ask people about their preferences, about what they think social media should be like, it's not at all what people tend to engage with. There seems to be a large disconnect between people's behavior and what they engagement and what people's ideals should be. And in some ways, this reminds me of like a lot of disconnects we have in our life. Uh, we, we think that we should be healthier. We think we should exercise more and eat better. But we um, are often tempt, tempted by uh, junk food. And I think this sort of shows some of the perils of the social media attention economy because social media is giving to us what captures our attention rather than what we actually want. I think it's promoting a number of things that most people would agree would be harmful. Yeah. So that takes me to, I guess, a question about that. I mean, do you think there are structural changes or policy changes or anything that can be done at that level? Or what, what are you thinking there? I, yeah, I think that there are a number of changes. I think I would say that one of the uh, biggest um, challenges is that I think that a number of these companies like Facebook, Meta, Instagram, Twitter would not want to implement changes that um, reduce their bottom line, that will reduce profit because a lot of these companies are based on advertising revenue, they um, profit off of keeping you on the platforms for as long as possible. And if promoting negative content, if promoting outgroup animosity keeps you on the platforms as long as possible, then they have an incentive to continue promoting that content. Um, so our survey found that people would like positive content and educational content and nuanced content to go viral, but it's very possible that if you created social media platforms that were very positive and nuanced, people would stop using them as much. And that would be good for society, probably, in my opinion, at least. Um, but it might be bad for these companies' bottom lines. So I think that, like, there are a number of solutions that could be implemented within these companies. Uh, like, we know that, for instance, before the elections, Meta has made changes to their algorithm such that they uprank more reliable sources in the newsfeed, more reliable news sources, and they downrank less reliable news sources before the election. They did this before the 2020 election, but then they just switched their algorithm back to normal right after this. So Meta knows how to make these changes. They could make them year round. They could make a number of algorithmic changes such as not promoting as much content that evokes angry reactions and instead promoting content that evokes heart reactions, which we know are associated from this paper, we know are associated with more positive content. So I think there are a number of things that could be done from the inside. The question is, do social media companies want to make these changes? And I think I am personally cynical that social media companies will especially like their stocks are struggling right now. I think they're going to do anything to really just keep people on the platforms and make as addictive platforms as possible. So I think the question now is like, how does like the, the government, for instance, create effective regulations and legislation that people will support? And I think that will be, that will be a big challenge up ahead. Right. Yeah. I mean, what you were talking about, about the incentives, 
you know, scares me even more because even if we, let's say we start, say, well, I'll, I'll start liking those or angry, reacting less or whatever, and we'll do that collectively, they'll do something else to get us riled up because they need us to be totally. riled up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, I wanted to ask you a question, actually, because I, I know from your email that you were involved sort of in the early days of the Internet, right? You were sort of involved in getting the Internet up and running, which is really cool. So I'm super curious on like what your perspective is of how the internet has evolved from some of those like early hopeful stages until like this current stage of the internet. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a little bit like democracy, you know, it's kind of a beautiful system and it just gets mm -hmm. ruined by people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, you know, there were days cool. when, you know, in those early days, you, you felt like you almost knew everyone, right? I mean, we were like conducting big yeah. transactions in without any checks, like we should have been totally ripped off, right? But, you know, you'd go buy a couch and you'd send the guy the money and someday you'd pick up the, you know, you just trust yeah. things like that, you know, and, and that just, that obviously just crossed over at some point where you, you couldn't do that anymore. And yeah, and structurally, you know, I don't think, you know, we thought about it that way very well. You know, you had, it's a, it is a democracy and people can build whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there's no real incentive to all, you know, you have, you have sort of the, um, you know, benevolent dictator model works great, right? But once you don't have a benevolent dictator anymore and you have bad actors, you can really take advantage of it. And, you know, and I, and I think it, you know, and I, I'm, I'm like you right now, I don't really know what this, those structural changes can be mm -hmm. because here you have this platform that has created immense wealth and not only for billionaires, but I mean, it's created immense wealth a across a pretty wide middle, middle class as well. So it's done a lot of good. Um, and, but, but then it kind of comes with <laughs> this, this yeah. other side to it. And, um, yeah. you know, and, and if you start regulating in certain ways, you know, I mean, I think something like, from my perspective, something like a third party, independent kind of transparency kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know, at, when you when mm -hmm. a company gets to be a certain size and things like that is probably something that, again, would have some effect, but it but it is going to hit the bottom line of these companies, I think, because they depend on, on the way it works now. So it's almost like if you had something like that, they'd have to think about how they, you might not have these. Uh, gigantic IPOs and, and huge valuations because they'd sort of know they're going to kind of hit a brick wall at some point because they, they, they sort of maybe can't take advantage of the kind of things they're doing now. Okay. So it would, it would change things and I think it would change it for the better for the people, but it would have harm to, I, I think it would slow these companies down because they probably couldn't continue. They'd have to kind of find some other ways to, to monetize that still would play in that space. And, and so it's a, it's a transition. I mean, I think it's like a lot of things, you know, we're, you know, people think we're sort of at the end of the internet. I think we're still at the beginning of the beginning. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it will be really interesting to see with all the, I assume you've been following all the Elon Musk uh, stuff that's like all over my Twitter right now. And it will be interesting. I mean, it seems just chaos right now in terms of what he's doing. Uh, and he seems to enjoy creating that chaos. He does. Yeah, he does. He's been around yeah. a long time creating chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and some of it is good chaos. I mean, you know, some of it is, I mean, ultimately I think I am a bit scared of what Elon Musk Twitter will look like, but I do actually think some of the solutions he proposed very on, like, um, when he talked about making the algorithm open source or creating, uh, giving people more control over like what kind of algorithm social media companies have. I think that that is actually like one of his good ideas. And, um, I think that would probably be a productive change. Like, I think more transparency on the part of social media companies would be really important. Another thing is I think social media companies need to give data to independent researchers, uh, researchers like us, psychology researchers, so we could actually see like what our social media companies doing to mental health and polarization. A lot of those questions can't actually be answered now adequately because all of this data from social media is locked up inside these social media companies. They are, we know that Facebook is doing a lot of internal research on the questions about like how Facebook impacts mental health and polarization, but they're not sharing this research with large audiences. And I just think more transparency and making data accessible is really important. And uh, Facebook, for instance, is planning on shutting down CrowdTangle, which is which was their pl primary platform through which they shared data to researchers. So I got the Facebook data from this article through CrowdTangle. 
Um, and Facebook is now planning to shut down CrowdTangle. So I wouldn't be able to publish an article like this if I wanted to do it next year, which is really disappointing. And also Facebook has like a very, um, they have a very aggressive like PR team. They actually, they criticize this article. We wrote a Washington Post op-ed, me and my co-authors about this article, and they wrote on their Facebook research blog about how our, our, how our article was simply wrong. And uh, then they had this long response where they basically um, cherry picked a lot of research articles talking about why social media is good and why social media doesn't increase polarization, which is like, I mean, all the articles that they cited were, you know, decent scientific articles because social media both has its pros and cons, but it was a classic case of cherry picking all the positive things. And I don't think that people are necessarily believing Facebook's PR responses, but um, it's disheartening to see how aggressive Facebook is with researchers and how uh, social media companies aren't just, you know, inviting researchers to actually study these big questions that are important for society. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I didn't hear I hadn't heard they were going to shut down that that system. So that's that's disappointing. Yeah, you know, and that's kind of what I was talking about in terms of the transparency with this mm -hmm. idea of kind of an independent body, maybe that could review these algorithms. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. You know, maybe they don't, ex maybe they don't necessarily expose them to the public if the companies are concerned about that, but it maybe could at least be exposed to this sort of independent body that um, you know had maybe some different best interests at heart. <laughs> Right, right, right. And a lot of other media has historically been regulated, like television right. has been regulated. So I think we might come to an era where social media will be regulated and we will come with up with effective regulations. And I think that like a lot of, I think there is, I mean, both liberals and conservatives have different problems with social media, but there is a lot of bipartisan support about how social media might be creating harms for like teenage mental health, for instance. And I think we saw that with some of the congressional hearings with Francis Haugen last year. So that gives me some hope. I'm not fully convinced that like Congress is like uh, technologically literate enough to come up with like smart regulations. I I'm hopeful that they might be able to be, but, um, but I am a tad cynical about it as well. So we'll see. Right. Because it's, it's definitely a challenge. You sort of have, a house full of octogenarians trying to come up with yes. these, these rules that, you know, that, and I think that it's going to require sort of some councils being put together, you know, that, totally. of experts yeah. and, and you have to hope that they get informed in that way rather than kind of the shoot from the hip kind of things that they, they could do. Yeah. And if they consult the right experts and the right researchers, then maybe, maybe it will be helpful. But yeah, social media is so constantly changing. TikTok is really taking off right now. And a lot of people are just completely ignoring TikTok. Um, research is ignoring TikTok, for instance. We we don't really have like all these articles being published about TikTok. And part of that I think is due to data accessibility. Like Twitter data is really easy to access. We we so far we can't access TikTok data. Um, so we kind of have no idea what it's doing. We have these vague general questions about it being spyware from the Chinese government, but we uh, I, I think there's just a lot of mystery around what TikTok is doing. And that seems to be the clear platform that's taking off right now. Well, and even YouTube as well. I don't think YouTube exposes mm -hmm. a lot of the secrets that they have as well. And YouTube can be a pretty radicalizing platform as well. Oh, totally. And yeah, it's one of the most used right now. I feel like TikTok and YouTube are sort of taking control. Uh, a lot of people are talking about how we're kind of moving away from a society that reads toward a society that, you know, watches video. I think a lot of Gen Z is getting their news from video, either through TikTok or YouTube right now. Yeah, for sure. And like you say, right now, like most of the world is kind of not looking at that very much. Yeah. And as you say, I don't think, as far as I know, TikTok doesn't have any kind of a data sharing policy for researchers. No, they said they would open up an API this year, but I think I'm a bit cynical that they're actually going to do it because Facebook, you, they're shutting down CrowdTangle. They've talked about phasing out CrowdTangle and they say that they're going to create a better resource for researchers, but I don't actually think they will. Like, I think these are just things that they're saying. Um, so we'll see. I mean, if they do create these resources, I'll be hopeful, but I'm definitely not on the side of like these tech companies are making us their top priority right now. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, it, uh, it seems like the uh, interests don't always align. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time and, and congratulations on getting your PhD. That's awesome. Thank you.
Thank you. This was a really interesting discussion. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I love this stuff. I could talk for hours on it, but I know (laughs) you've got better things to do, (laughs) but I really do appreciate it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. It was great to talk to you. Thank you. Good to talk to you. Have a good day. You too. Bye-bye. That is it for this episode of the Outrage Overload podcast. The links to everything we talked about in this episode go to outrageoverload.net. I want to thank you so much for listening to the podcast. We wouldn't be able to reach the top 2% in social science podcasts if it weren't for you telling your friends about the show. So that's my one ask for this episode. Just tell one person about the show. Tell them about an episode you really enjoyed or you thought was interesting. Okay, look for a new episode in about two weeks.